OK, um, I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks everyone for joining today for um, our first CSPI webinar um, discussing our new funding opportunities. Uh, thank you for bearing with all of the um, technical um, any technical difficulties we have as this is our first webinar and um, thanks for being here with the last minute switch of platform. Um, so I'll just go over a few um, logistics for the webinar to start. Hopefully everyone can see the presentation. Um, we've got everyone I believe is on listen in mode, um, but it appears that the Q&A um, is working. So um, as you have any questions throughout the presentation, please submit questions via the Q&A function and um, my colleague Katie Marks will um, compile all of those and as soon as we're done with the presentation we'll start walking through Q&A um, and facilitate that way. Um, and by the way, to introduce myself, I'm Noelle Battle, the Grants Manager um, at CSPI um, and I'm joined here um, by Katie Marks on our policy team and three members of our SNAP team, which um, who will be speaking after I um, give a brief info on, intro on the opportunity. OK, so um, many of you may already be familiar with CSPI, but just to give a background, um, if some of you are less familiar or new to the organization, um, we're a consumer advocacy organization that's been leading uh, the leading independent authority on nutrition issues since 1971. Um, through advocacy, policy, education and litigation, we work to make it easier for all Americans to eat healthfully. Um, some of the efforts that we've led in the past involve um, securing uh, nutrition facts labels on packaged food in the 90s, adding labels for trans fat, added sugars and other major and major allergens, uh, working on menu labeling in chain restaurants, supermarkets and theaters nationwide, um, getting uh, soda and junk food out of schools and improving school nutrition and reducing junk food marketing to kids. A bit of a background, so we were recently awarded a grant from Bloomberg Philanthropies to lead national advocacy initiative to secure state and local food and nutrition policies that improve public health and provide models that can be replicated and scaled. Um, as part of this, a very important part of this opportunity um, is, is partnering with state and local advocates such as yourselves um, to advance policies in specific areas, including schools, restaurants, grocery stores, and through federal, state, and local programs. Um, our vision overall is a healthy nation with reduced impact and burden of preventable diseases and an equitable food system that makes healthy, sustainable, food accessible to all. These are the four current campaign opportunities, uh, which the first of which we'll be speaking about today. We have other webinars throughout this week that will be talking about the three other opportunities if you're interested in joining any of those as well. And just to give a brief overview, um, we'll talk a lot more about the specific opportunity today, but we're specifically looking to fund applications that um, have a strong focus on community or field organizing and grass tops engagement, um, incorporate a strong focus on equity in all aspects of the campaign. Um, we're looking to partner uh, with new and diverse organizations who are um, representative of the populations where their policy is focused, given that be a state or city or other locality. Um, and organizations that are also you know potentially grantees that are going to be partnering with other individuals or community based organizations in their location. We're looking for campaigns that have a robust media and public communications plan um, that are you know have thought ahead about the potential obstacles that might um, encounter throughout a policy campaign or other work and how those would be mitigated and identification of specific policy champions um, within state and local government where applicable. 
And just to touch a little bit upon, um, we really do see these grant opportunities as developing partnerships and um, there's a lot of resources that we can provide for grantees um, to take advantage of within our teams. Um, we've developed a lot of toolkits, messaging research and communications materials um, for both national and localized work. Um, we are, can provide financial support and be involved with some paid media opportunities or other um, forms of digital engagement, um, technical assistance on policy and science, as well as support staff on media uh, testimony um, and articles, um, op-eds, things like that. Um, also support from our organizing team and support with state and federal lobbying. So with that, I will um, hand it over to um, my colleagues on the SNAP team who will walk through um, the specific opportunity and then we'll save a lot of time at the end for all the questions. Thanks so much, Noelle. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, my name is Joelle Johnson and I'm the campaign manager for Healthy Food Access at CSPI, um, which primarily encompasses our SNAP program. So I'm going to talk with you a little bit today about our campaign priorities and you're going to hear from uh, my two colleagues as well, Maya and Cassie, in just a moment. Um, before we dive in, though, I just want to touch on a few other housekeeping things. Um, like Noel said, we're going to have a lot of time for questions, um, so we're going to try to wrap up our presentation um, by about 3.30, maybe 3.45, and we have until 4.30, so that leaves a, a decent amount of time for questions, so please don't hesitate to pop them in the chat if you do have any. Um, and then someone had asked earlier if it's being recorded, and it is, so we will we'll share the recording of this um, webinar afterward. And then the last thing is um, if you want to follow along as we discuss the campaign priorities, um, Maya dropped uh, two links in the chat box, one to the campaign priority document that was um, listed on our website uh, on the RFP page, and then a newer document that um, we recently linked to that is a, a public health vision for SNAP um, CSPI document. So we'll kind of be touching on both of those today. Um, so to uh, start off with our, our public health vision for SNAP, um, and you can go to the next slide, Noel. Um, so CSPI envisions a, a healthy nation with reduced impact and burden of preventable diseases, as well as an equitable food system that makes healthy, sustainable food accessible to all. Our current food system perpetuates preventable disease and, and values corporate wealth over public health. We need to change the focus and individuals should not have to fight an upstream battle alone. So with more than 240,000 participating retailers, SNAP is well positioned to leverage the food environment to support healthy eating for all. Um, our top priorities uh, as they pertain to, to SNAP and, and promoting healthy eating for all include supporting the, the heroic efforts of anti-hunger and anti-poverty organizations to push for a benefit increase as well as protecting and expanding access to SNAP. We're also engaging with community-based organizations, SNAP participants, researchers to explore strategies for strengthening the public health and nutrition impact of SNAP. So we'll go into uh, more detail about those in just a minute. Um, but for more background, so we know SNAP is effective at reducing food insecurity and alleviating poverty, um, but the evidence is, is mixed on whether or not it improves diet quality. Um, there are many strategies to leverage SNAP to support healthy eating um, that may help address ad existing disparities in diet quality among priority populations, but more research is needed. Um, so the campaign priorities for this funding opportunity uh, are, are geared to, to kind of address that, that gap in information. And they were um, informed by stakeholder feedback that we received through our previous work in Massachusetts, North Carolina, Iowa, and Pennsylvania, as well as through national focus groups and polling, both with SNAP participants as well as um, non-SNAP participants, expert recommendations, um, specifically the Bi -policy Partisan, uh, Bi Policy Partisan Center's report, uh, 20, let's see, 2016 report, the National Commission on Hunger's um, 2015 report, 
as well as existing research. So there's been one randomized controlled trial and then a couple of modeling studies that have really formed kind of the foundation of, um, of our, uh, our, our priorities. And we are happy to share links and, and lit reviews and you know whatever information you want to see pertaining um, to those uh, different categories I just listed off. Um, so uh, I also want to mention that community and SNAP participant involvement is really key in, um, in, this, in this vision and, and thus it is a required component of our, our funding opportunity. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Cassie um, who can talk a little bit more about our community engagement um, opportunity. Um, hi everyone, I am I'm going to talk about the first part of our funding opportunity, which is um, statewide community engagement with SNAP stakeholders, um, which are grants up to $50,000. And um, there are a few required elements um, in this funding opportunity. Um, so we do say that we want you to um, convene with stakeholders across the state um, regarding SNAP, but um, I should also mention that an exception can be made if you're planning to capture the needs of a specific population. Um, and you can include your justification for that on your grant application. Um, and we're hoping that you're able to discuss lots of different approaches for strengthening nutrition and SNAP um, at these convenings, but um, at your community engagement work. But um, one of our goals at CSPI is sugar reduction in the food environment. So um, when you do have these conversations with the community, um, we are asking that, you're, that you discuss um, two specific strategies um, related to reducing consumption of sugar sweetened beverages or SSBs. So this would be um, funding the uh, funding SNAP incentives with um, SSB taxes and also um, healthy food incentives paired with SSB disincentives, such as um, disallowing um, soda purchases with SNAP money. Um, and CSPI may be um, able to partner in um, your work, so um, please feel free to um, ask us um, any questions, um, Noel. Um, put the um, technical um, assistance that we'd be able to provide. So um, moving on to the um, other um, aspects, of the uh, mandatory aspects of this, um, we want you to have focus groups with SNAP participants. So it's really important to um, center the voices of the people using the SNAP program. Um, so and um, we also want you to be able to, at the end of your community engagement work, provide a final report that would summarize your recommendations um, that came from this work, your levels of support for each strategy, and also the plans, if any, to address next steps. So um, CSPI has previously done these convenings in four states, um, but we're currently shifting the strategy so that they're community led, um, just so the states will know the best ways to engage with people in the state and identify these key players. And um, we're, um, we have a stakeholder engagement model that we've used previously, or you can develop your own. So um, previously we've done things like have an advisory committee in the state. Um, we've had key informant interviews with SNAP experts and um, SNAP retailers. And previously we've also done statewide polling. So, um, but I think that um, you all in the states will know the best way to um, capture the voices of SNAP stakeholders. And so that's it for me. I will now turn it over to Joelle. Thanks, Cassie. Um, so now we're moving on to um, a second component of uh, the SNAP funding opportunities, which would be public policy or pilot interventions. Um, so there we, we say both because there are sort of two distinct, distinctly different op options here um, and one would be more of a pilot and one is more of a policy. 
Um, so the the pilot um, option is to um, is to actually test the um, healthy food incentive paired with a sugary beverage disincentive to see what the impact um, would be on uh, not only diet quality but also food security, health, access concerns, or and, I'm sorry, um, and assess concerns related to um, stigma looking at the burden on retailers, possibility for non-compliance, um, many, many important elements that we would need to understand and know before um, you know, moving toward policy, if that would in fact be the direction um, to pursue or to, to pursue with this approach, depending on um, what the, the pilot research finds. So um, ideally, what we'd like to see here is um, have, have applicants um, pursue USDA waivers to be able to test this strategy um, within the SNAP program itself, as opposed to, um, you know, a, a, like a similar, designing a separate but similar um, study with SNAP eligible but non-participants um, it's it, 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 we would have much more accurate findings, I think, if we were able to do it within SNAP. And so um, it's it's a it is definitely a bigger lift. There have not been that many waivers that have been submitted um, for testing these kinds of healthy eating strategies in SNAP before. There are a couple, um, but uh, but none that have been submitted at least within the last four years. So we'd be looking to to partner with states that are interested in in submitting those waiver applications. Um, though I want to note that, as Cassie just pointed out, the community engagement is really a required precursor for this approach. Um, we we want to we only want to see this approach done in places where there is stakeholder support um, and where community members and SNAP stakeholders have um, have weighed in and expressed their interest and, and support for pursuing this. Um, so and like I said, the, like the waiver approaches are, are preferred. It, it could be possible that you do it another way. Um, you know, if you if you don't think it's going to be possible to um, to apply for a waiver in your state, um, but you think that you could, you know, uh, gather enough support from from other um, funders, including us, to test it as um, uh, as a as a you know a privately designed pilot. We'd be open to discussing that that as well. Um, so I guess there are kind of two approaches there, but the waiver approach is preferred. Um, and so just again to reiterate, the, the reason we put this in here is because um, from what we've seen, the evidence is mixed on, on whether SNAP improves diet quality. And so we think that it's worth testing strategies um, to strengthen nutrition in SNAP. Um, the second approach is um, looking at, and, and sorry, before I move on to the second one, um, there is more information about uh, what the modeling studies have found and some various ideas for how to like design this um, pilot in the campaign priority document. So just to save on time, I'm going to point you. I'm going to point you there. Um, so the the second part of this would be the the policy approach, and that would be um, looking to uh, to design a, a community led campaign for a um, sugar sweetened beverage tax with the intention or, or priority of having a portion of that revenue go toward um, SNAP fruit and vegetable incentives. So um, a statewide sugary beverage tax would help address, you know, the, the um, high consumption rates of sugary beverages that we see across all income levels. And then at, um, the added benefit would be that revenue could help pay for these incentive programs, which I know is an interest and priority among many states that have um, already implemented those incentive programs, uh, either, either statewide or in specific jurisdictions and are looking to, um, to fund those programs long term or even expand them if they haven't been able to do it statewide yet. Um, so the the other key piece for the sugary beverage taxes, though, is that we really want them to be um, community led or have a very strong element of community support and involvement. Um, we've seen this approach in a few 
we, this approach has been very successful in a few jurisdictions, um, and specifically DC is working on um, a very community-led approach right now, and, and um, we think it's a good model that could be used in other localities. Um, in 2019, there was a, a work group pulled together um, by Praxis Project and Healthy Food America um, to develop kind of a set of best practices for these community-led um, sugary beverage tax campaigns. And they have a resource um, that is in the final stages right now. Um, it'll be ready uh, to share publicly, I believe, in mid-December. And so um, once that is available, we'll, we'll disseminate that uh, through our network. But I think there's a lot of really good information there um, that could help inform applications for this uh, particular component. Um, and then the last thing I'll just mention is that, like I said, we, we'd like SNAP incentives to be kind of among the top priorities, but, um, but we really want to see the, the community members themselves weigh in on how that revenue should be spent and what kind of health promoting programs it should go toward. Um, and if SNAP incentives is one of those, that's great, um, but we don't want to, uh, to dictate where that money goes. Um, it, should, it should be going where the community most needs it. Um, okay, I'm going to kick it over to Maya to talk about the the um, third leg of this funding opportunity, and she can also introduce herself. Thanks, Joelle. Hi, everybody. I'm Maya. I'm a policy associate with the SNAP team here. I'm going to talk a little bit about our seed funding opportunities, and there's also this very similar wording in the document that we posted earlier. So as we mentioned a little bit previously, we also have some seed funding for up to $30,000 per campaign for grantees to pursue additional strategies related to strengthening the public health impact of SNAP. So here we list some ideas for seed funding, but we're very open to other strategies that come out of the community engagement work. I'll touch on these examples below briefly, and then I'm happy to answer any questions after we finish up with this portion of the presentation. So topping off with a really important one, we know that increasing access to SNAP and SNAP participation is a really crucial public health strategy to help reduce poverty, food insecurity, and alleviate healthcare burden. Um, but unfortunately, we know that too many people face barriers to accessing the program. So grantees could seek funds for work related to re reducing these barriers. Um, additionally, retail strategies could be pursued with seed funding. They could go towards promising strategies that have been identified through research to improve food marketing through SNAP. We know that unhealthy food and beverage marketing impacts dietary behaviors and may be linked to disparities in diet-related disease because evidence suggests that some manufacturers and retailers target promotion of unhealthy products towards people with lower income and people of color. And there's even some examples of this that's specific to SNAP. For example, sugar sweetened beverage marketing has been shown to increase during the time of the month when SNAP benefits are distributed. So through our community, community engagement work so far in Massachusetts and Pennsylvania, Iowa and North Carolina, participants and other stakeholders have voiced a lot of interest in using retail marketing tactics to support healthy eating, and that could be a strategy pursued through seed funding. Relatedly, as the online SNAP purchasing pilot has rapidly grown in the past few months, we know that strategies are needed to encourage healthy online retail environments and other innovative delivery models, and also to ensure that participants can afford and access online SNAP delivery. Strategies to align SNAP and Medicaid are also available for seed funding. They're the two, two of the largest federal public benefit programs, high eligibility overlap between the two, and some groups are already leading really important work to help more people access these programs by coordinating enrollment and renewals, and grantees could seek funds to further this work or to test other promising strategies to align the programs to improve public health and nutrition. And last year for our examples are strategies to enhance state nutrition action committees. That's USDA's Food Nutrition Service has prioritized the formation of these coalitions and they work to align state programs related to nutrition and health. Seed funding could go towards strengthening this work and establishing plans to address food insecurity and nutrition related disease. And these plans could also drive efforts to seek SNAP ed funds to cover the cost of expanding the work of these councils. So those are some examples that we've listed, but as mentioned here, we're very open to other innovative SNAP policies or pilots that come out of the community engagement work that aim to ensure access to the program and to advance public health and nutrition.
OK, does that wrap up um, all of your presentations there? Are we ready to move to Q&A? Yes, we are. OK. Um, OK, so I have, um, well, I will talk briefly about the next steps and then um, I have listed some specific Q&A that we anticipate that we've gotten via email um, or other channels and I can cover those questions first and then we'll move to questions that have already been submitted via um, the chat. So um, we will um, circulate and post to our website this recording as we know some folks are having technical difficulties with our last minute changes or not haven't been able to access this um, or if anyone else is interested um, we'll share the recording and feel free to share that um, we're asking for applications to be submitted by the end of the year um, and then our plan is to most likely um, at this point we would be giving grants for up to 12 months starting in February of 2021 um, through the end of our current funding cycle, which is January 31st, 2022. Um, we are looking to build um, longer term relationships and hopefully we'll have future rounds of funding um, for additional work in the future or for you know, continuing policy campaigns that get kicked off um, in this first round of funding. So um, here is contact information. Um, for myself, if I am happy to um, take any questions and can send them along to our respective, um, my respective counterparts. Um, here's also emails for Joelle, Cassie, and Maya, um, who are speaking today. And if you do have any questions, um, technical questions about the application platform, you can email me um, or you can also email info at commongrantapplication.com. Uh, their technical support is um, usually very responsive and helpful, so um, hopefully they can help you with those questions. Um, so to jump into, I've just added here a few um, pieces of Q&A that um, to share um, in some of our responses. So um, Specifically, uh, applicants have asked if they can apply for more than one campaign opportunity. Um, and the general answer to that is yes. Um, we applicants, we ask that applicants submit a separate application for each. Um, if you're interested in applying for a SNAP campaign or a SNAP community engagement um, application or and also potentially school foods or one of our other campaigns. Um, the Common Grant platform allows for once you work on one application and submit it, if you go to the same link again, because all of the policy campaigns have the same link, there is a separate link for the community engagement work since we have different application questions there. But if you're um, looking to resubmit a separate application, it should pull up all of your same organizational information so you don't have to um, submit twice. Um, we do have some instances where, you know, we're thinking about where um, we're talking with partners in states where there might be sort of considering an omnibus bill that is um, linking together some of these specific campaigns. So if you're thinking about an idea such as that, probably the best thing to do would just be reach out to us um, directly if you're planning on tying some of these policy opportunities together and think it makes most sense to submit one application. Otherwise, we'd ask for separate applications. Um, and I think someone in the chat submitted a question about can we submit um, for a community engagement work and a policy campaign within SNAP. Um, others on the team can jump in, but I think um, if it's in focused on the same area or the same location, most likely we would want an uh, application submitted first to do the community engagement work. And then depending on the outcomes of that work, um, if the organization is then interested in pursuing a policy campaign that came out of the results of a convening in a particular state, 
um, and maybe partnering with other organizations that were involved in that convening, then that would be a separate um, application down the line um, or as, as part of another funding opportunity. Um, but if you're interested in uh, community engagement application and then potentially one of these um, seed funding opportunities, um, I believe you could submit applications for both of those um, within this funding cycle. Um, we've had some questions about uh, can only 501c3 organizations apply? Um, primarily, we our funding is focused on partnering with other nonprofit um, organizations. Uh, we can give funding to 501c6 organizations um, and 501c4 organizations. Um, if you have a particular other, we are working, you know, potentially with consultants um, on SNAP convenings uh, in different states. So if you have um, a specific opportunity um, or a question about your organizational structure, I suggest just reaching out to us um, directly and we can talk about that. Um, in next question was, can applicants apply for funding for lobbying activities? We've given some general guidance for this on the RFP document that overall uh, we do encourage applicants to apply for a portion of their funding to cover lobbying activities, both direct lobbying and grassroots lobbying. Um, we do have limits on how much funding we have available to give out for that. Um, so it's about 10 to 20 percent of their overall pool of grant funding. Um, but if you're looking to do a specific activity that would, um, you know, be focused more heavily on lobbying, again, feel free to um, reach out to us and discuss that. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, um, we understand that timelines, currently we're looking at about a 12 month grant period that we'll be offering with this current round of funding. Um, so we are hoping, you know, that applicants in your applications be realistic about what you think um, can be accomplished within um, up to a year period. We're probably giving out um, shorter awards for the community engagement periods of three to six months, um, I believe. And, um, but, you know, we see this as building the relationship and then um, hopefully you know, we would have funding um, down the road to continue work for policies that would um, last more than um, a year to get, to accomplish that. Um, I will hand it off um, if Joelle or Maya, if someone wants to comment on um, the SNAP specific questions on the slide here. Yeah, I, yeah. I'd be happy to. Um, and after we get through these two, then we'll kick it over to Katie to um, to to voice some of the questions that have been asked in the chat. So the first question here, um, if we're pursuing SNAP community engagement and or policy grants, are we committed, required to promote SNAP uh, disincentives, particularly around sugar sweetened beverages? Um, no, we're not requiring that um, unless you are applying for the um, the combination, the healthy incentives plus sugary beverage disincentive pilot approach. Um, we are not requiring that you promote disincentives in any way, shape, or form. What what we are asking is just simply that you include that in your discussion in um, in your community engagement activities. Um, particularly, what we're looking for is is feedback um, from various SNAP stakeholders across the country. Uh, you know what what the um, you know what the level of support or opposition is to to this approach. So that's why we we included it. Um, it's of particular interest to us and to to the funder. So we just want you to um, to make sure it's among the you know the topics that you discuss in your community engagement activities. And then which application should we should be used to apply for seed funding? And I, I've seen this question in quite a few of the people in the chat, so hopefully everyone's listening up. Um, if you want to apply for seed funding, you should just fill out um, the policy campaign application in Common Grant. Uh, OK, um, Katie, can you uh, let us know what questions are coming in through the chat? 
Sure thing. So for the most part, I'm going to try and go in order that people have asked the questions, but you know, there's a few that we've gotten that have been pretty popular, so I'm going to start with those to make sure those get addressed. Um, so one big question folks have had is how many grants we anticipate awarding? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we don't have a, a finite number of grants that we're planning to award. Um, it's just a matter of um, it, it kind of depends on on the amount um, that is requested in each of the proposals, but I believe that we've budgeted for. Um, well, I don't know, this is a tough question to answer. Um, if so, let's put it this way, if everybody asks for and gets the full amount of funding, so say. Um, People applied for a hundred a hundred thousand dollars for the sugary beverage tax campaigns, then we'd be able to fund three of those. If um, everyone applied for seventy five thousand dollars for the community engagement or for the incentive disincentive pilot, then um, I think we'd be able to fund four, four or five of those. Um, if everyone applied, if you applied for the maximum amount for seed funding, um, we could uh, 30,000, we could fund three of those. And then um, the maximum amount for community engagement, I think that would be um, uh, five to seven. I don't I don't know exactly off the top of my head. So I, I don't think that I'm not sure that information is particularly helpful, but um, that is my best guesstimate and it. Um, but we will just have to wait and see how you know what people ask for. Great, thank you. Um, another uh, question that we've gotten a couple times is uh, about the SSB tax and so what what's the alternative if folks are in a, a very conservative state um, where they want to make sure they can achieve wins rather than possibly hurting their cause by advocating for something that they don't know is possible so is the only public policy option through the ssb tax campaign um no well uh no i mean you could do policy campaigns related to the um the seed grant uh, opportunities that were listed. Um, so I think that would probably be the best um, best alternative. Or you could do some um, community engagement work around uh, sugary beverages and try to do some grassroots um, and and you know and advocacy work to to build support for a sugary beverage tax down the road. Thank you. And so addressing a question that came earlier. Um, so in the list of spaces where SNAP could be promoted, would we um, accept farmers markets to be in that list? Um, I'm not sure what which opportunity that would pertain to. Um, I will say that generally we are more interested in um, in expanding SNAP um, access to grocery stores. Um, I, th I think there are other funding opportunities out there for um, for for getting SNAP benefits accepted at farmers markets. So that is not a top priority for us. But if you're interested in doing something related to SNAP benefits and the and grocery stores, um, that is an area that that we're a, a little bit more interested in, but I think um, but maybe you could reach out to us uh, directly with that question um, if there's if there's you know more to it than that. I'm not sure I answered that fully. Thanks. Um, so another question we have here is our current SNAP ed implementing agencies eligible to apply for this funding since they cannot advocate for specific policy proposals? Um, Noel, do you know? Um, 
Um, I would say. Um, because many um, SNAP-Ed implementing agencies are 501c3 organizations, um, I would say that yes, um, SNAP-Ed implementing agencies um, uh, of that type are eligible to apply. And um, I would also say that you don't necessarily have to apply to um, to advocate for a specific policy, there's still the community engagement work that can be done and also um, building support for um, um, specific ideas um, within the community. Thanks, Cassie. Another question we had is, um, Someone was asking us to speak more in depth about our ability to support lobbying and advocacy efforts. So, um, you know, what can we do in support of statewide work? What would the partnership look like between CSPI and the grantee in terms of this aspect of the work and the lobbying advocacy efforts? Um, Noel, do you want to talk about that? Um, I can't speak to specifically um, the type of resources that um, CSPI would be able to offer in terms of lobbying support and, and how maybe you could talk about how specifically it would work um, in SNAP. I know for some of our other um, initiatives and the campaigns, we are actively involved in um, lobbying for programs at the national level and are looking for um, our local partners to get involved in that lobbying at the state level um, or with their representatives from their respective state. Um, we do have uh, organizing teams here that you know will actively engage um, and are available to support um, grassroots lobbying activities. Um, obviously, um, they are applicants, you know, would be the experts on the ground to um, and have all of the relationships to conduct those grassroots activities. But um, we're happy to liaise um, and, you know, share across grantees what is um, working, um, like what is what other partners are doing for lobbying work and um, advise on specific details about what we can and can't fund um, or and whether, you know, this the logistical you know, tracking of lobbying funds. Anything else to add? Um, yeah, so within the staff opportunity, the, the reason that or the, I think one of the ways we envision um, using lobbying or, or incorporating lobbying into the work is um, uh, particularly with the incentive disincentive waivers, if that's a route that an applicant decides to go, we would definitely want to see um, a community organization work with a, a lobbyist who can help to, um, you know, garner support from the necessary uh, uh, people to to submit that waiver application. So the social services secretary uh, probably needs support from the governor. Um, so that would be so it wouldn't be like a, we're, we're not anticipating anybody applying only for lobbying activities. It would be a component of um, of the, poli the the sugary beverage tax policy campaign and probably a component of the um, the incentives disincentives uh, pilot. It could it could potentially be a component, I guess, of the seed of of some of the ideas under the seed um, seed grant too, uh, since those would likely be likely also be policy campaigns. Great, thank you. Um, so one question that has come up is with a lot of money in. Um, state money going towards disaster, SNAP, or pandemic EBT. Um, incentives have been applied for those benefits. So with responding to RRFP, can we uh, can they propose incentives on disaster SNAP or pandemic EBT, or would we only expect these um, expect to fund RFPs working with regular SNAP? 
That's a great question. Um, I don't have an answer to that right now. Um, so if for, for whoever asked that question, if you could just shoot me an email, um, I need to check with uh, with our policy director um, to see if that would be if that would be OK. But I think that's a great question. So um, we'll make sure to to share an answer to that um, broadly once we have it. Thank you. And so, um, does seed funding require prior community engagement was another one that came up a couple of times. Um, it's not required for the, it's not required for that bucket, um, but I would say that, you know, we just, we generally uh, strongly encourage that for, for all activities. And so another question that has come up is, um, is our funder interested in investigating the barriers that exist with using a SNAP card? And is the focus really more invested in health outcomes or sugar use in marginalized communities? Um, just, I guess, a further explanation of the, the focus of the funding. Yeah, so the focus of the funding is really to identify promising strategies for strengthening nutrition and public health outcomes in SNAP. Um, so I think, you know, the, the latter half of your question is, is definitely aligned with, um, with this funding opportunity and with uh, the interests of the funders. I think looking at um, issues related to the SNAP card, that could be something that would be a good fit for the, um, for the seed funding as it, as it could uh, potentially create barriers um, to people, you know, accessing or utilizing benefits. Um, so, yeah, I hope that I hope that answers that the <laughs> both parts of that question. Great, thank you. And so one person had the question, um, what they're gathering from this is that we would require that projects first start with statewide community engagement practices. Um, either through our grant opportunity or on their own before applying for other grant opportunities. Is this correct? Yeah, so let me let me uh, sort of, but let me rephrase it. So um, if you are going to, if you're interested in um, a policy campaign, if you're interested in the sugary beverage tax policy campaign or the um, the SNAP waiver, we do want to see community engagement as a component of that. So. To break that down further, if you are interested in applying for the incentive disincentive waiver, we want to see you first conduct community engagement in your state. So that that would that would end up being sort of like a two part project. So you would first apply to us for the community engagement funding, conduct that work, and then depending on the outcome of that work and and if incentives disincentives kind of rises to the top of the strategies that people in your state are interested in testing, then we would invite you to come back to us for additional funding to pursue the way, you know, the, the, um, the waiver or the pilot related to that idea. If you are applying, um, it's very possible that the result of your community engagement work may not be um, incentives, disincentives. It may be something that has to do with um, something in the seed grant category. So in that case, again, we would say come back to us and let's see if if um, if we can get you additional funding to pursue one of those ideas um, with some of the seed funding. If you're interested in applying for a sugary beverage tax, you don't need to do the community engagement work first, but it does need to be a comp it, it needs to be part of the overall campaign plan, the campaign structure for pursuing that sugary beverage tax. Um, so like I said, I can provide, um, once we have this, the document from um, the Praxis Project and Healthy Food America published, which should be in mid-December, I can share that, which has um, kind of best practices on, on how to design a, a community-led um, tax campaign, or I'm also happy to talk with you directly about it. Um, so I hope that I hope that explains. You can also um, it, it, you can also apply for a seed campaign 
um, or seed funding directly. You don't necessarily have to do community engagement work prior to that, but we would want to see in your proposal some evidence that like what you're applying for is something that is um, is a top priority for SNAP stakeholders in your state. Um, and then like Cassie mentioned earlier, we do have a model for stakeholder engagement that we are happy to share. Um, but you are also welcome to propose your own uh, your own stakeholder engagement methods or community engagement methods. The final thing I'll say is that if you have already done the community engagement work um, prior to this funding opportunity, then you, you could go straight to applying for um, a, a policy or pilot. Um, so are there additional questions, Katie, that came through after I gave that long answer? <laughs> yeah, so just to clarify, um, is our expectation that if the applicant plans to do community engagement work or is prior um, engagement work required bef um, before to be eligible to apply? Um, I, so in the case of the incentives disincentive waiver, you have to do the community engagement work first because you, we, we need to, you need to be able to demonstrate that that is an approach that is like of top interest among stakeholders in your state. There's no way to know that until after you've done the community engagement work. So we can't fund you for the whole thing until we've seen that that is a strategy that is, you know, there's consensus around pursuing in your state. If you're gonna apply for a soda tax, you can go ahead and apply directly for that and demonstrate that community engagement is part of your campaign. And we've got another bit of a follow up question to that. Um, so for the SSB policy funding, would that be open for longer than December 31st to allow for more time for the community engagement work? So like Noel said at the beginning, um, at this time we cannot. Oh, I'm sorry um, to apply for it. So the the December 31st deadline is for is for applications. Um, the the activity, you know, the the um, Funded activities would need to be wrapped up by January 2022, right, Noel? Yeah, I think that is a bit tricky, you know, the situation that we're in in terms of funding. Um, our key, you know, immediate priorities um, is doing these statewide convenings and con community engagement work. Um, there is the possibility that if if we if someone applies for a community engagement grant and is planning on doing that work in the um, three months, you know, January through March or as whatever timeline at the beginning of 2021, that then once we're engaged with that stakeholder group, we would be open to accepting an application, a follow on application for the outcomes of that work for potential additional funding um, based on the outcomes of that convening and what policy recommendations are required um, pending funding availability. But I think that would be the model that we see. And so we realize that um, it makes it a bit challenging because after uh, you know the period um, that the community engagement work is done, um, we'd have to assess at that time um, the priorities that have come out of that. And um, but I think that's primarily how that would happen: is we would have engaged with the organization or organizations in a state, and then follow-on funding could come from that in a specific opportunity to follow. Um, but and so we'd only be accepting, you know, within the current window is policy campaigns that are already where the community engagement work has already been done. And, um, you know, there's prioritization and uh, a group would be looking to move forward on a policy campaign early next year. So, yeah, all this is to say that we know that um, one year may not be enough time to to do all of this work. Um, it's but it's the limitation that we have with the funding um, that we currently have. So we're, we're hoping that that um, 
we'll be able to extend campaigns um, that need it, but we cannot guarantee that at this point in time. So, um, you know, all this is to say that we'll we'll do the best we can and see what we can accomplish in the year. Um, and yeah, we'll work, we'll kind of work through it um, with each individual applicant. Great, thank you. And so we've got another question about SNAP-Ed. So in this person's location, SNAP-Ed is not a 501c3, it's a university extension. So would they be able to partner with them if they were the applicant? Um, so this is asking if the university extension would be the applicant. Um, I don't know. I think uh, I see the person who's asking this question and um, reach out. Just reach out to us directly. You can email either me, um, Jay Johnson at CSPINet.org or, or Cassie C. Ramos at CSPINet.org and we can talk about it. Um, I think you have some other questions uh, too that we might be able to um, more easily answer over the phone. Great, thank you. And so another question about um, a group that's working on SNAP EBT, uh, credit and debit card used at farmers markets statewide. So they currently have a state legislator on board and their end objective is to gain bipartisan support for funding equipment and double days value. Uh, SNAP ed funding is an option and could advance health and nutrition community state in um, statewide. I heard you say farmers markets are not a priority, but our request to fund a pilot includes grassroots activities and state legislation. Um, yeah, I mean, the main reason that, that we're not, uh, that we didn't include farmers markets in this opportunity is because there are other funders out there that have a specific focus on farmers markets, and we're trying to capture other elements of, um, of, of SNAP that um, that we haven't seen other funders touch on yet and that also we think um, we feel are really kind of providing the basis for um, developing ideas for for um, strengthening nutrition and SNAP. And I fully acknowledge that, you know, farmers markets are an important component of that. Um, but I like I said, I, I think there are other funders who are covering that territory. So I wouldn't say that that's a top priority for for this funding opportunity. Great, thank you. So another question we have, if they're applying and including other partners in the project, would we require letters of support or just a list of those partners? Um, yes, in the common grant application, it does ask for letters of support from, from key partners. And we ask for two letters of support. Um, we've asked typically one letter for from a partner and one letter from a previous funder, um, ideally. But um, in the application, there's a question about partnerships and I think any broader coalitions or partners you're working for, you don't need um, letters of support from all of them, but it'd be helpful to outline what the specific roles are with each partner that you're working with um, and how they'll be engaged throughout the work. Great. And another funding question, can nonprofits partner with for-profit orgs under this funding opportunity? Yes. I, oh, sorry, go ahead, Noel. I was going to say, I think it depends on the situation. Um, we have for one of our other campaigns, we funded you know, an individual consultant who is a content area expert and um, to help, you know, that was already leading a coalition working on a policy. So we have funded, um, you know, small groups that are LLC structures. Um, so I think it's, we will evaluate that on a case by case basis for the organizations. Yeah, and I was just going to point out that um, one situation where that partnership might um, occur is uh, for the community engagement work. We have um, 
um, you may want to work with a consultant to do the focus groups um, or some some other um, forms of you know information and data collection. And in that case, you might the group you may want to work with um, you know might end up being a for profit organization. Um, and so in that case, you know. I could see there being a partnership um, there. I'm sure there's other examples beyond that, but um, but yeah, we would want the primary application or the primary applicant for the funding to be um, to be a 501c3 or um, I think 501c6 you said earlier, Noel. Yeah. Great, so we have a question about um, community engagement and so this person has said farmers markets are a great place to engage with SNAP users who are into healthy food. So that could be a good spot for the um, community engagement piece. Um, would they be able to partner with a food bank with this funding? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, yes, that's a great point. That's absolutely true. Um, and and yes, you can definitely partner with with food banks. Great. And so our question queue is winding down. And so this person had asked us to repeat the question about pandemic EBT. And so that was just about um, whether or not the RFP could be for uh, pandemic EBT or disaster SNAP or just regular SNAP. And I believe Joelle said that you could email her um, to discuss the details of that further. Yeah, we just um, I don't have a I don't have a clear answer on that right now. So um, if you can follow up with me afterward, I will um, I'll talk with our policy director and, and get a specific answer about that. Um, and I'm just going through some of the published uh, questions to make sure we didn't miss any. I see there was one question asking about um, seed funding and if those campaigns have to be paired with um, sugary beverage disincentives or if they can be standalone. Um, and I, it, no, they do not need to be paired with with um, sugary beverage disincentives. They they can be standalone. Um, and um, yeah, the other question, the other piece of that was, um, could the seed funding go towards federal policy work? Um, uh, no, we're primarily funding state and local um, uh, policy work. Maya, do you want to say anything yeah, else about that? Yeah, and I had, I had responded to, to this person's question individually, so feel free to reach out to me at the email posted there about that question. We were encouraging funded campaigns to help build support for federal legislation to increase SNAP access and benefits and also to promote some of these strategies at the federal level. Um, but in terms of the whole seed funding grant going towards federal opportunities, we would want to talk more specifically about, about what that might entail, but generally this is more state and local focused. Great, thank you. And so we got another question. Do we have an application template that we could share a budget template and what is our indirect rate? Yeah, so the applications um, on our RFP posting site, um, the applications are submitted through the common grant platform. So you can access either of the links for, as I mentioned before, there's two separate applications for um the community engagement grant and the policy grants because um, we have slightly different questions that we're looking for um, so you could follow either of those links create a account in common grant and then you'd be able to access all of the questions that are on the application so there are specific questions that you would answer each um, field within the application to submit. So do please take a look at that before you get started preparing application materials. There is also a budget template um, which can be which is an Excel document that will be that you can download um, and a reference form template that can be downloaded um, and then should be uploaded with your submission and um, details about the indirect cost rate are on the template. Great, thank you. So another question that has come in, this person is in a large state and so their outreach uh, list is statewide. Forever, however, for community engagement or incentive programming, they just focus on several counties or a region of the state. And they're curious if that would be an issue. 
Um, so we would like it to be statewide um, for community engagement and um, and uh, taxes or waivers. Um, but if you if there's a good reason why you would just focus on specific counties, um, I think we could discuss that individually. We had put in the campaign priority document that um, if you were in a region where um, there are tribal nations and um, you were focusing specifically on um, on those uh, on those you know um, populations, then that would you know that's something that we could consider. Um, there is also there have also been a, a few groups we've talked to where they themselves are maybe not completely statewide. They cover maybe three fourths of the state or half the state, um, and so they're looking at partnering with. Um, with other organizations that may have um, specific ex specific expertise in the jurisdictions that they don't operate in, um, so that collectively or com combined, the groups would cover the whole state. Um, so that's another another thing to think about. And maybe Joelle, you could just talk to um, like with our North Carolina convenings, for example, how those were run, given that that was their most recent convenings, which were done virtually, and it was sort of three separate smaller convenings that were focused regionally around with stakeholders regionally and then all of those results brought together. Yeah, right. So um, so I'll just briefly touch on the two different ways that we've done this work so far and with the caveat that you do not have to do it this way. Um, this is just how we did it, but we acknowledge that you may have um, uh, other methods and models that work well um, in your state. Um, so pre pandemic, um, we we would do um, we would set up regional convenings and so say for the state of Pennsylvania, for example, we kind of broke it into central, um, western and eastern and we did three meetings across the state and just had people come to whichever one they were um, was geographically closest for them. Um, and then uh, we and then we worked with different groups that could do um, the, you know, uh, focus groups and um, they could do focus groups across you know in like different pockets of the state um, since the pandemic in north carolina we did it virtually so we um for the convenings like uh you know speaking with snap stakeholders we um we set up three different ones um so on three different days and invited kind of grouped people by their region and invited them to um to their region specific, you know, virtual meeting. And primarily I think because it was a good way for them to engage with um, with other, you know, organizations and partners in, in their region. Um, but, you know, you could also open it up and invite people to attend, you know, any of them. It's a little bit easier actually to do it, you know, when you're doing it virtually, it gives people more flexibility. Um, so that'd be one one model for doing it. Um, and in the case of North Carolina for the the SNAP focus groups, um, we we ended up doing those virtually as well. Um, the the partner that we were working with was able to conduct those over Zoom. Um, and I see a question here just since we're on the topic about um, is the grant program for regions versus statewide or multi state initiatives? Um, so yeah, primarily, like I said, statewide, though I think the seed grants, um, those could be regional um, multi-state initiatives, um, potentially, <laughs> uh, if, if you are an organization that works across multiple states, um, you know, we could, we could talk about that. Great, thank you. And so would folks be able to partner with their city or their county or current SNAP education providers? Yeah, I don't I don't see why not. Great, so that was the last question that we had in the chat. We can give it another few minutes or a few seconds if uh, if someone's typing something up, but I think we can we can start wrapping things up now. 
Okay, well, um, we want to thank you all so much for taking the time to participate in the webinar today and for um, your patience as, as you were the, the guinea pigs in our, our first of the webinar series. So if you're planning to attend um, any of the subsequent ones on, on our other policy uh, or on our other funding opportunities, we encourage you to do so and, and um, we'll do our best to make sure that, uh, that those are, are run a little bit more smoothly in terms of um, uh, actually getting into to the chat or into the webinar. Um, but we thank you all for your thoughtful questions um, and we really appreciate you um, sharing them with us and the rest of the, the interested um, uh, groups that have participated today. And um, yeah, we I, I know that this is a little bit of a complex funding opportunity where um, we've got a lot of you know, focus areas. And so if anything remains unclear after this webinar, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself, Cassie or Maya about um, our campaign priorities or to Noel about um, the actual application process. And we will do our best to, to get you answers and um, and help you, you figure out if this is the best fit for you. Um, anything else anybody wants to add? Okay, well, um, yeah, thanks again, and uh, I hope everybody enjoys the, the rest of their week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Just a reminder that there will be a recording of this shared with everyone, and I'll pass along the slides as well. So look out for another email from me. Have a good week, everyone. Bye.